the Sabbath day.
happy Sabbath. We are thankful that you have uh, tuned in to our platform that we can review our Sabbath school lesson. And to those of you that are here, we welcome you. Thank you for participating, for coming. Without your presence here in person and without you online, we won't have a Sabbath school. So we thank you once again for your presence. So now at this time, we just want to have an opening prayer and we will start the review of our Sabbath school lesson. And we are praying. Our God and our Father, we thank you for what you have provided for us. We thank you for life that you have given us. We thank you for forgiveness through the merits and the blood and the life of Jesus Christ. And now, Father, we pray and we ask for your Holy Spirit that he will come, open our minds, impress upon our minds truth, and most importantly, give us that obeying spirit to follow what you have taught us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, we are reviewing the seal of God and mark of the beast, part two. Part two. So in order to just catch up, let's see what part one told us about the mark of the beast. Who remembers something about the mark of the beast, part one? And it's a system. It's a system, yes. No. That's very important. Because sometimes we associate people with the system just like we associate behavior with a child. For example, growing up, I remember hearing, you are bad whenever we did something bad. But the idea should have been, your behavior is not appropriate. That's what they should have taught us. And they should have said, you are a good person. However, what you did today was so-and-so, it did not be whatever it was be. But we associate everything together, we lump it, you are bad. And of course, many individuals grew up thinking that they were bad people because that's what they heard from the beginning. And so the same thing we do with our systems of worship. We lump the people with the system of worship. So we need to separate the people from the system. In that specific system, they are good individuals. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in a prophetic way, it says, they are my people come out of her. So if you say, you are my people come out of her, that means that they can be separated from the system. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay, what else do we remember from the Mark of the Beast, part one? What else do we remember? Don't be shy. I know you and online have some opinion, but we can't hear you, unfortunately. It has to be here, those that are in the class. What do you remember? How about, where does the mediator comes in in this system? So let me break it down slowly. In our understanding, who is our mediator in heaven on our behalf? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our mediator in heaven on our behalf. But this system teaches that there are other mediators. Mm -hmm. Can you name some of these mediators in this particular system? It's, it's the, um, I know the main one is the Pope. And then, uh, and also the priest, because if, when, they, when you go to confession, the priest stand like Christ because you're only supposed to confess to Christ, but then you, you confess your, your sins to the priest and he actually forgives you. Okay, so in, this system, in this system, the priest has the power, takes on that power to, you? well, I'm just going by what they say first. Yeah. In this system, the priest has the power to forgive man his or her sins. Does the Bible teach that? No. no. Okay, so we agree. The Bible does not teach that man, another man, whether he's a priest or whatever name he may have, he does not have the ability or the power to forgive us our sins. Okay, so what other individual is presented as someone that is a mediator between man and God in this system? Oh, Mary. Mary, Mary yes. yes. Mary, mother of God. Forgive us and that other that goes on and on. And the, the way it is taught, it is said that when Jesus cannot intercede on our behalf, Mary has the power to convince God the Father. So that means in this system, who has more power than who? Mary has more power than Jesus. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that Jesus has the equal power with God the Father. And that Mary, just like every person on planet Earth, depends on the mediation that Christ did to his Father for salvation. 
Mary, yes, was his mother, but like every individual in the world, her road to salvation was through Jesus Christ. Okay, one more thing. What other mediator do we find in this system? There's another one. And there's um, something else. They did not stop with Mary, but they have all these different saints. Oh, okay, so, so the many saints. Of them. So in biblical terms, what are saints? What are saints in biblical terms? People that overcome this world. People that overcome this world? And I give you another hint. Committed sin. I give you another hint. Paul writes to believers mm -hmm. and he calls them saints. saints. Yes. yes. Yeah. Blood yes. wash. Blood yes. wash. Blood wash saints. Mm -hmm. So in the biblical terminology, a saint is a person that has been baptized, has been given their life to Jesus Christ and they are followers of Jesus Christ. That's the biblical concept of a saint. Mm -hmm. In this system, a saint is someone that died, yeah. mm -hmm. not even resurrected, but for some reason, somehow, they got into heaven, mm -hmm. and they are mediators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each individual, when they are born, if they look on the calendar, in that system calendar, there is a name. They will name their children after the name on that day, mm -hmm. because that person on the calendar is the child's mediator, mm -hmm. or the person's mediator. So you have saints yeah. with a different concept in this system that they have power to mediate and to protect individuals on earth. They have Mary as the greater mediator between God and man. Jesus is secondary. So imagine, this, this is fallacy. The Bible does not teach that. So many individuals that are true followers of God they believe everything they can do and whatever they have been taught in this system they have been practicing sincerely but at some point they will hear the voice of God and they will recognize that what they were doing or where they are is not the place to be and they will need to leave yes you, you know what the one of the uh, points of that scripture I think sometimes we get crossed up when it says come out of her my people and be not partakers of her sin. Mm -hmm. So we have to be ever so careful mm -hmm. when we come out that we are not partaking of the sin. And it gets really scary sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, good point, good point. You know, again, as the beginning of the introduction I was saying, we have been taught that our bad behavior is associated with us, the person. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we do with everything in life. And that's why God has made it clear. Come out of her, my people. You are still my people. Even though you are in error, you are still my people and you need to come out. So that is the blessing that God gives us. You know, and he let us know that in no uncertain terms, terms, who are his people? Even us as Christian believers, sometimes, sometimes, we don't follow 100% what he has prescribed to us. We follow 50%, 60%, 70 and perhaps even 99%. Something is missing. That 1% is missing because it's supposed to be 100%. 100%. So, with that said now, we can, we can jump right into this week's lesson. The Seal of God, Mark of the Beast, Part 2. Part 2. And our memory verse is Revelation 13.10. Revelation 13.10. And it's kind of a surprising. Why would that be our memory verse? What does it have to do? It says, He who leads into captivity. Somebody is leading. So we got to look in little parts. He, whatever it is, is leading something into captivity or someone shall go into captivity. So the same thing that this system has done, this system will end up having to suffer the same consequence. That's what it is saying to us. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So that means that this system utilize the sword at some point to kill. And the same way this system used the sword to kill, the sword will kill this system. But we understand by prophecy, it was a deadly wound that would be healed. So the system did not die. 
the system came close to death, mm -hmm. close to death, and not die. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And this is just the part of the text, but it goes on. If we read the whole thing, it gives us cues as to who this system is and what they're all about and how it happened. Question. Yes, question. Um, it says, who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. I was thinking, I'm not sure, that um, when it says kill with the sword, it may mean, uh, because we call the Bible as a two-edged sword. Okay. So I was thinking those word, the same words of the Bible will kill them because in the sense that they're not obeying, obeying the, the words of God. Okay, I, I can go along with that interpretation. Yeah, I can go along with that. Let's remember, using history now, this religious system utilized something to evangelize the world. What did they use and how did they implement to evangelize the world, from what you remember? This is historical facts, not biblical, but historical. And we know that history confirms what we have studied in scripture. So we are going on the assumption that you have been with us from the very beginning and you know where we're going and who have been identified with it. So bear with us. If you're missing something, then just text us something and we try to answer you next week, okay? But I'm hoping that you've been with us and you know where we're heading with this. Okay, those of you that are right here, right here. From what you can remember, from what you read in history, what method did this system use to evangelize the world? Because they had the truth and the rest of the world were pagans. That was the idea. Pagans are heathen. So they were going to convert the pagans or the heathen. What did they use? Did they use the cross? They used the cross. I wish it was only the cross. <laughs> they used the cross or something. Huh? Was it education? Education was the least thing they wanted the people to have. Compromise. Something else. The cross was carried, but there was something else that the, the, the followers of this system had in their hands. S W sword. Sword. Oh, and the sword oh. had the symbol of the cross at the handle. Mm -hmm. So if we turn it this way, oh. if we turn it this way, Sorry. this is the handle, mm -hmm. uh, and this oh. is so that was the cross, oh, yeah. and that's the sword at the same time. Yeah. So the idea was, as they went forward oh. to the world to evangelize the world, to evangelize pagans to evangelize heathen. It was either they accepted the cross or they will fall by the cross. Oh, so that's why it says here in the, in the scripture, what says the Irving just by said. The that, yes, by okay, the sword. Yes, by the sword. They used the, oh, wow. Yeah. They did not just go, oh, we want to evangelize you. We would like you to be Christian. No, it's either you accept or you die. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to just say. It was that sword that killed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like force. Really. Yes. Force. Yes. And guess what? Same. That same spirit, that same mentality of you do as I say or you die will be repeated. As a matter of fact, it was repeated in history. The introduction gives us that. Let me just go to that. Uh, if you go to your lesson quarter, page 96, the introduction section. Introduction. And I'm just going to read some of it. It says, in the 15th century, which is 14 something, the Piedmont Valleys, high in the Alps of northern Italy, were home to the Waldenses. And who were the Waldenses? For what we remember, who were these people? Waldenses. Who were Waldenses? They were Christians who they held were on Christian to the word of God. That lived by the word of God and refused yeah. to go according to this system, method of worship or following what they call was the biblical way. So go back to the Waldenses. This was the home of the Waldenses, a people determined to stay faithful to their understanding of the Bible. As a result of their steadfast loyalty to Christ, they were fiercely persecuted. In AD 1488, the Waldenses in the Valley of Lois were brutally murdered by the Roman Church of Faith. For their faith. So, it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. The introduction continues. Another persecution, another wave of persecution, came in the 17th century when the Duke of Savoy sent an army of 8,000 into their territory and demanded 
that the local populace quarter his troops in their homes. Imagine how, 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 how much more strategic and cruel that can be. So, Sister Tanya, we are the government. And we would like to have some of our soldiers stay at your home. No. That's what they did. That's what they did. They didn't say like, they commanded you. They commanded. Yeah. We have our soldiers and they have to have a place to stay, mm -hmm. a place to eat. Mm -hmm. So we want to send them and you have to provide. put them up, provide for them. Hmm. It, it sounds almost like one of the, the biblical stories that we have heard that, you know, we can see this satanic spirit working. The man is out on the battlefield. The king sees his wife takes his wife, brings him home, the husband, so that he can cover up what he already did. The man is so loyal to the king and his men that he refuses to go home. And after all was tried to get this man to stay at home with his wife and everything failed, he gave him a letter. And it was the letter of his own death sentence. You see where I'm going with this? This man was forced, in a way, to take his own death sentence. The Waldenses, on the other hand, they were forced to take in the soldiers. And what did the soldiers did? They massacred. Uh, and that local populace quartered his troops in their homes. They did as requested, but this was a strategy to give the soldiers easy access to their victims on April 24th. 1655 at 4 a.m. a signal was given for the massacre to begin. This time the death toll was more than 4,000 people. And that was not the only time. There was another time in France also when it happened. The massacre of Saint Bartholomew. A whole lot of Christians died. Why are we saying this? Why do you think we are looking at this? Well, no. History repeats itself. History repeats itself, that's one. Another reason, why do you think you know, we have this information before us? Besides history repeating itself, what else do you have? You have knowledge so you can make an, uh, a right decision. decision. You have the knowledge so you can make the right decision. And what is the right decision? It's to follow Christ. To follow Christ. Mm -hmm. That is the right decision. Amen, amen. Because the time will come that the plan will be again presented to eradicate every single person that opposes the way the national society and system sees fit to worship. So if we don't ascribe to that, it's going to be the same thing. That would be the ultimate situation, yes. No, I was going to say we have to practice every day, mm -hmm. you know, abiding in Christ. And we have to choose every day because we That's are, the key word. we're going to have to make a yes. choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though we have chosen to walk with Christ, mm -hmm. there's going to come a time when we have to choose to continue to walk with Christ. Okay. I'm glad you made that comment. We have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Let me make it difficult for you. Yes. You have children. So let's put the situation that the child has a handicap. Mm -hmm. The child is an adult, 30, 40, 50, and they have a handi handicap. And they say to you, we have noticed that you have decided not to worship on the first day of the week, and it's not going to be called the first day, it's going to be called the seventh day, mm -hmm. Sunday. We have noticed that you have not decided to worship on Sunday, the seventh day, according to the scriptures, which is according to man, in this case. We're going to give you one chance. Either you conform or we're going to kill your child in front of your face. What will your response be? Hmm. See, I'm not making it easy for you. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. We want to believe that we will say, go ahead knowing that our child is in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. But we don't know if we are there. And that's why we need to make daily choices and ask God to help us to have that kind of a faith of Jesus Christ that even if the ultimate thing is death of our loved ones or of ourselves. 
history repeats itself. And by God's grace, one or two things going to happen. We are going to be alive when that time comes. Or we might be resting in the grave when that time comes. I, I'm sorry to put it so graphic, you know. I, I, I'm sorry to be a, a, a doomsayer. But the scripture tells us these things are about to happen. And the reason you and I and us are hearing, discussing this, is so that we can make up our minds that when we know, when we come to this point, we already have made choices in favor of Christ, that the choice will not be an, a hard one. It will be an easy choice. But if we don't make those daily choices, when that time comes, it's going to be very difficult. Somewhere in the great controversy, it says that those who do not practice their faith in God, when that time of terrible persecution comes, it will be almost impossible to follow God. So let me give you another gruesome situation. You still have your parents alive. Your children and you have decided no matter what happens, we're not going to give in to God. No matter what happens. Even if it's death. We're not going to give in to God. I mean, we're not going to give in to the system. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. We're not going to give in to the system. And your children have agreed, yes, we, we, we're, going to, we're going to be faithful to God. And you have decided you're going to be faithful to God. But now we're talking of your parents, your children, grandparents. And they say, we're going to give you an example, a one-time deal. We're going to start with one eye of your grandmother. And you're going to witness it. And your grandmother is going to see for the last time what you look like. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, biblical comments tells us that this happened just before the last captivity of the children of Israel. The king had refused to pay his tribute to the Babylonians, to the Assyrians, to the Assyrians. And he said, okay, the last thing you will see are your children. Pluck his eyes out. And this is biblical. This is in the Bible. This was the enemy of God because his people had rebelled against him over and over and over and over and over to the point that God said, okay, you, you're going to be punished. So the gruesome examples that I'm giving, they are biblical and they have been recorded in history and they will be repeated. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And in the in the in the words of our Sabbath school member here, choices. The practice are the choices. Every single day. Every single moment. You know, we go through life almost an automatic pilot. You know, we go to work, we start up the car, and you're driving, and before you know it, you're parking in your car space. You are not thinking, I gotta make a right, I gotta come off of this exit, I gotta wait at the stoplight. Because you did it so many times that it's an automatic pilot. You got in your car and before you know it, you park in the parking lot where you work. That's how our response to God should be. As we make these choices every single day, it becomes automatic in our life that it doesn't matter what happened, we make the choice in favor of God. And that's where, yes. Absolutely. God saves people and he gives them warnings. He gives them information so that they will not be caught off guard. And that's the beautiful thing of prophecy. Prophecy lets us know what is coming ahead so that we can make preparation ahead of time. Not at the last minute. Okay. Yes. 
Absolutely, 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 absolutely. So, with that, now we can move over to Sunday's review. Because remember, we're not studying the lesson, we're just reviewing. We're reviewing the high points that we have seen around our table, that you have seen around your table while you were studying. So, Sunday's lesson talks of the deadly wound. Deadly wound. So, let me ask the question that was right there. It says, Read Revelation 13, 5, Revelation 12, 6, and 14, and Daniel 7, 25. The question is, how long would this power dominate the religious landscape in the previous century? How long are they going to have this power? How long are they going to have this power for? 1260. Hmm? I don't hear you. Oh, 260 years. Yes, thank you, thank you. This power will, will have rule, rulership for 1260 years. Now, again, as we have looked at history, in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel specifically, it gives us at least seven distinguishing marks that we can know who this system is. It's not like a random thing. In the book of Revelation, we have at least three different places that give us distinctive mark of who the system is. And when we compile these two together, Daniel and Revelation, there is no doubt in our minds who the system is. Let me just mention some individuals, uh, I guess they are religious scholars or religious readers, that they say this, this system applies to Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. He was one of um, France's leading person to conquer the world. <laughs> and they say he fits the mark of, he fits the beast and he fits the mark and everything. What comments can you give me that say yes, he fits it or he does not fit it? You have one way or the other. Yes, Napoleon Bonaparte fits the, the, the beast power, or he does not fit the beast power. What's that? Oh, Napoleon, famous little short man, <laughs> Frenchman, and he rode, he rode a big horse, yeah. and he commanded France to take over the world. That was a nutshell. Yeah. And the last battle that he has, the Battle of Waterloo, he was going to England to conquer England. That was the last resistance, so to speak. And one thing stopped him. One thing stopped him. God's intervention stopped him by having a big mist of um, fog. Could not see where he was going. He just could not see where he was going. And because of that, he was defeated. Because the, the English army were able to get themselves together, fight him off, push him back. So they say that he is this beast of revelation. Hmm. What do you think? It couldn't be because he's dead. <laughs> okay, he's dead. Okay, that's one reason he couldn't be. What another reason why you think he could not or could be the beast? Because the beast is a system. A system and he's living. This is a system and living and Napoleon is one person. Mm -hmm. yeah. One person. Mm -hmm. The same thing they said to Hitler. Adolf Hitler, the next German one, not an ex German, another person that happened to be a German with aspirations of conquering the world. And he sent his troops in three different directions. That's how much army he had. He sent them to North Africa, sent them to Europe, and he sent them to Russia. Can you imagine the kind of machinery, military machinery he had to conquer the world? And God stopped him when he went to Russia with what? Something as simple as the weather condition. Same thing. Napoleon Bonaparte was stopped because of the weather condition. Could not see fog. Germany was stopped when they went to Russia because the cold was so intense. They were accustomed to cold and snow. It's nothing new because the whole of Europe has cold and snow. But when they went to Russia, it was a different cold, a different snow that happened that year. Men died in their tracks. They could not make it to the front. 
Yes, yes. It was frozen. They could not move forward. So, Hitler's, on the other hand now, he said his Reich, his kingdom, his rulership was going to be for a thousand years. One thousand years. 1945, what happened in 1945? His kingdom, his rulership came to an end. 1945. And he was pushing his machinery from 1938, but it got intense in the early 40s. It got really intense that it was, it was, it was determined that he was going to take over the world. Yes, you have no, something? I was, I was just thinking that's not too far, too far moved, removed from what we are now. Yes. And, hmm. So, can you imagine, the, the, the one thing that can say to disqualify Hitler as the beast is the kingdom did not last a thousand years. No. But the scripture told us that this system beast will last for a thousand two hundred and sixty years. So, reverting back to history, because, you know, this is not a ground, we, we are hopefully you already established that, those benchmark before. 538. 538 to 1798. History tells us that's a period of 1,260 years. The Bible prophecy says days, but we know by prophecy a day represents a year. And all the pinpoint mark, mark, all the pinpointing marks led us to understand that this power. This system was so powerful. Let me just go into a little bit of history. This system started out religious-wise. Mm -hmm. There was just the church, the Christian church of Rome, the bishop of Rome. But at some point, Constantine decided that he was going to fortify and strengthen his kingdom. So he moves from Rome to Constantine Byzantine to strengthen his kingdom, but that was his mistake. As he split himself, his kingdom became weak. And so the barbarians from the north started invading with a ferocity. That Constantine came up with a plan and said, okay, you know what? Since you are the bishop of Rome and you have so much influence with your church, why don't you see if you can do something to stop the wave of invasion by the barbarians? So on a certain day, the bishop of Rome came out and spoke to the barbarians, and that stayed the army for a while. That gave Constantine some time to regroup, and he was able to get rid of the barbarian tribes, at least three of them, three of them. So from that moment on, they gave a certain recognition and authority to the bishop of Rome, and his power begins to climb, little by little, to the point that in history, as is recorded, it says that kings and queens and princesses had to ask for an audience to speak to him. They just could not go up to him and say, well, your highness, the pope, who you like to talk to? No. As a matter of fact, one, the history tells us that there was one king, I don't remember his name right now, he had failed to do something that the pope had asked him to do. So when, in turn, he went to visit the Pope, the Pope said, no, let him stay out there. So he stood in the snow for three days. That's the kind of power the system had. So the, the, kings the bishop trembled. was higher even than the king? Yes. Oh. He was the bishop of the church, then he became, became the Pope of the church. And when he became the Pope of the church, at that point, he had power. As a matter of fact, they were able to be marry at that time. They could marry. And it was after the 13 centuries when they came up with this thing that the popes and priests and all of those in this system will be celibate. They will not marry. But today we have heard of some cases, and I want to get into that. Let's leave that alone. Let's leave that alone. Let's leave that alone. So, from 538 to 1798 was exactly 1260 days, 1260 years. As the Bible puts it, 
uh, 42 months in Revelation. So all these, Revelation speaks of this beast and says this beast has 42 months and it also says that this beast has times and times and a half and two times. And it's the same language you find in Daniel and Revelation, in the book of Daniel. So as we look at these two books, we come to the final conclusion that the beast power that was mentioned in Daniel is the same beast power that is mentioned in Revelation. So that is, hopefully you already got the background before we got into that. If you don't have it, just you know, text us and we try to explain to you a little more. Okay, so let's go to Sunday, the first paragraph. That's just going to give us exactly what we are saying to wrap it up. It says, the beast will come. Anybody has it back there that want to read it? Because I don't want to be the only one doing a monologue. Yes, go ahead, please. The beast will continue for a specific duration of time in history. In symbolic time prophecies, a prophetic day equals a literal year. In Numbers 14, 34, we read it for every day a year. Applying the wide principle of counting a day for a year. Again, God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. This principle has repeatedly proven itself accurate in interpreting biblical time prophecies, such as the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Calculating the time period mentioned in Revelation 13, 5, 42 months, or 30 days in a month, we come up to 1,260 prophetic days, or Okay, so we stop right there. So that sums up what we have been saying. You know, it sums it up. It sums it up nicely, you know. And one point that I, I just need to emphasize before we move on, remember that in the context of the time when this prophecy, when these prophecies were written, the calendar had 30 days, not like what we have today. Today we have 30 days, 31 days, 28 days. 29 days but back then in the whole concept you know for hundreds and hundreds of years their calendar only had 30 days only had 30 days so that's something if somebody say oh well, we have 30 and 31 yeah, that's true but in the context we got to look at where the context comes from mm -hmm. the context comes from 30 days okay any comment that you want to add at this time before we slip on to the next page no okay Let's go to Monday and see what Monday tells us. The falling away. And again, we start with the scripture and the question. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 4, 9 to 12. What does Paul predict about the last days? What identifying marks does he give for the beast, the Antichrist power? I repeat the question again. What does Paul predict about the last days. So Paul comes before John in the Isle of Patmos. So we want to put it like in you know, our pieces. Daniel comes in the Old Testament. Then we have Paul writing in the New Testament. And then we have John putting the picture together. So if we put all of these three together, there's something interesting. So the question is, what does Paul predict about the last days? What is going to happen in our time? What identifying marks does he give for the beast, the Antichrist power? What are your answers? What did you come up with? What did you find then or now? Either way. Sit as God in the temple. Okay, so one of the identifying marks is that this religious power system sits in the place of God. And we mentioned earlier that this system says that a man can forgive another man his sins. And the man that has the ability and the power to forgive the sins is known as a priest. The Pope also has the same power, ability to, con uh, to forgive sins. So, that's one of the things, that's one of the identifying identify marks when it says, sits in the place of God. They are doing things that only God can do, that only God has that prerogative. Okay, what else, what else do we find? He's a deceiver. He is a deceiver, he is a deceiver. And the deception comes in all the different theological, misconception, unbiblical teachings that have been passed on to us. Yeah, that's, what, yeah. That, that's the, uh, that is absolutely correct. And that's why when the statement is made, uh, be not partakers of her sin, when we come out, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we are not being partakers. Absolutely. Amen to that. Unfortunately, Mm. Going back a little bit in history, so we can tie these pieces together. 
when Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King? Martin Luther. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm jumping ahead of my characters. <laughs> Martin Luther was a priest. And after he started reading his Bible conscientiously, he said, wait a minute, something is wrong. The church that I love, because he did not intend to leave the church, the church that I love is teaching some heresies. You're right. And I cannot stand by and see these heresies go further. So he wrote them out. When he finished, there were 95 things that he found that was wrong with what his church was teaching. Put them on the wall and nail them on. Yes. It's amazing, like, what I understand I'm glad you brought up that example. I'm glad you brought up the example. People were not allowed to read the scriptures. That's the first thing. They were not allowed to read the scriptures. That was the first thing. The second thing is they were indoctrinated to believe everything the priest said. Mm -hmm. yep. The third thing they could not refute because it was not in their language. It was in the Latin. highly educated language of the day. And the highly educated language of the day was Latin. Mm -hmm. So only the priests had the ability to read Latin. They were very well educated people. They were reading Latin. And they would tell the people what this meant. They would read for 30 minutes and say, well, let's say it means that you have to give me $5. Something to that effect. Mm -hmm. you know. So if they can't read, and they can't read Latin, and they only can get it from the public, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to follow along. They're going to follow along. That same mentality has persisted over the centuries, whether you believe it or not. Let me give you some examples. In some churches, without being specific, in some churches they say, give me a thousand dollars as a seed money mm -hmm. and you will have your money multiplied ten times. And what do you think people do? They believe. They give the seed, they did not read it from the scripture, mm -hmm. they heard it from the pastor, whoever he was, and they just followed along. So this has spilled over from that time. Mm -hmm. Another thing that has spilled over, very well intentioned people adopted different things as they fought back what this system was teaching. And some said, you know what? Baptism is not holding a child and sprinkle water on the child's head. <laughs> Baptism is by immersion. So this particular group of religious believers have as their motto, Baptism. Mm -hmm. That's Our next one said, there mm -hmm. are methods mm -hmm. to go to heaven. Yeah. It's not true, the saints. Mm -hmm. no. But we have yeah. to follow these prescribed methods. Yeah. Methodist. Mm -hmm. And to this day, they practice methods mm -hmm. to heaven. Mm -hmm. They saw the wrong that the church had at that time and they came out and they, hold, they held on to their methods. Mm -hmm. The other one held on to the baptism. Mm -hmm. The other one held on to, well, we are not part of the Catholic Church. We are part of the state church created by Henry VIII, known as the Anglican, Anglican church. church. So their thing was not really to do anything different from the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. As a matter of fact, they do everything like the Catholic <laughs> Church. The, the only difference is They're that married. one is called Catholic and the other one is called Anglican. <laughs> Oh, and the priest could marry. And, and the priest could marry. This is an exception to the rule. Yeah. And the reason the priest could marry was because Henry VIII was the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And he was married. <laughs> <laughs> so we find that even though they, 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 their eyes were open and they saw many of the errors of the church, by the same token, they kept some of the errors with them. They kept some of those errors. And one of the biggest errors they have kept over the years is worshiping on Sunday. 
That's the biggest error they have kept. Worshiping on Sunday, yes. In the state of the dead. State of yes. the dead. Yes. As a matter of fact, this system teaches that you can pray for the dead person mm -hmm. and get them out of hell's fire, and put them in move fire. them into limbo if they were a very bad person, yeah. and then they can be transferred into heaven. Now, when they get to heaven, they have to go through somebody. Peter. Peter, St. Peter, he's at the gate. Yeah, with the keys. No way in the Bible. <laughs> well, you say it's not in the Bible, but they have a biblical principle that they apply erroneously. They say when Christ said, Peter, upon this rock, yeah. I establish my church. Mm -hmm. But what they fail to realize is that when the scripture says Peter, unfortunately not everybody can read Greek and Hebrew and all right. of those things. Mm -hmm. Jesus was referring to Peter by his name in as a little rock. Yeah. Peter. So if you're a little rock and my church is on you, we have to understand something different. Peter failed, and then Jesus spoke of he is, his body will resurrect and he will be like, like um, Jonah three days in the belly of the whale. And so when you put all of those things together, we know that it could not be referring to Peter as the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church has to be Jesus Christ. So, unfortunately, some of these things, you know, the arrow goes on. And not only in the Catholic Church, we find that Peter, St. Peter, as they call him, is standing at the gate to open, to let them in or not. But we find that in the other church systems, they put the person into heaven. The person just goes from death, from life, straight into heaven. And the expression commonly, not to make any fun, but seriously, you know, the expression we have heard so many times is that mama is looking down. Mama is smiling. Or Uncle Charlie is this, or Uncle Charlie is that. That is not biblical. Uncle Charlie and mama, they are waiting in the grave until Jesus comes the second time. If they made their elections straight with Jesus, they will come up when Jesus returns a second time. If they did not, it will be the third time, and the third time is for condemnation. So, we find that the system has influenced the church, the world also, over the years. Even though the wound seemed to be the deadliest wound. And by the, speaking of the wound, when the Pope was taken captive in 1898, all their powers were stripped. 1798, thank you, 1798. All their powers were stripped. They had military power, mm -hmm. they had religious Just power. And the way they had the military power is that they had the power indirectly. They would tell this kingdom to do this and that kingdom, that was their indirect military power. When it came out to the church, they had direct power. Mm -hmm. So in 1798, that came to an end. But then in 1929, somebody by the name of Mussolini in Italy said, you know what? We can, we can give back the church their properties and everything. <clears throat> so the church got a territory, a small territory. They got their religious power right in the, almost in the heart of Rome. And the interesting thing is that, if you don't know, they have a military system. They have their own coins, their own postal service, their own embassy, and they send ambassadors. Which church in the world has that? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just saying this system has that. Yes. But besides this system, which church do you know that has an embassy, mm -hmm. has its own postal system, has its own monetary system, has its own military guard? Mm -hmm. Which other church? Name any church. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just to mention a few, not to pick on any, but just for a few. Um, Pentecostal church? I don't know they have a system that have their own monetary system. Adventist church? I don't know they have the we, because I'm we, you know. I don't know that we have a postal system and monetary system and ambassadors. I don't know we have that. There's only that one system that has that. That's the only system. Okay. Any question, comment? Moving along. Yeah, I would like to yes. say... Yes, um, question here. Hold on a second. He's going to give you the mic so that okay. you can come online. Uh, the people online can hear you, but not mm -hmm. in the audience. It is um, so amazing to me. In um, Second Thessalonians, like, chapter two, verses three and four, mm -hmm. 
explains everything and to see that these words are there for us today so that we could read it for ourselves to see what is going to take place. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Expect there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed a son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me explain something to you guys. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I witnessed this when I was a child, about five years old. I grew up in a Catholic country, and everything in that village, in the countryside, belonged to the Catholic Church. So we were Methodists. So you know, the school is there, is the, the building belongs to the Catholic Church, and the church is right here, so I go into the church. And I see on the pulpit, the altar, the Bible, they had a big, big Bible, and it was chained to the altar. Yeah. And that's what I saw when I was around five years old. And, this is and I remember century. it to this day. <laughs> and this is in the 20th century. Yeah. This is in the 20th century. So go back mm -hmm. to the 13th and 14th century, the same exact thing. Same exact thing. The Bible was chained to the pulpit mm -hmm. so that nobody could take it from there. And the only person that had authority to use the Bible was the priest. And if they had to move it, then they had their own key to unlock it and move it yeah. around. You know. But other than that, it was chained to the pulpit. Yes. Okay, so 2 Thessalonians tells us that the falling away is going to come before we recognize the man of perdition. So he was actually speaking of the power that is behind the different systems in the world that opposes God. So let me make it plain. Paul was speaking of satanic power. And he says he will be revealed when the time comes. We will know exactly who he is. With all the deception that he is working, Christians have the ability to recognize him. And he's never ever going to come in an open state and says, you know what, I tell you you're not supposed to worship God anymore. He's not going to do that. We got to go back to Eden. When he started, he came in a subtle way. Reasoning. Using scripture. When he came to Jesus, the same exact thing. So what makes you think he's going to come different to us? Hmm. He's going to come the same exact way. That's why we need to know the scriptures for ourselves. We need to have the Holy Spirit revealing to us on a daily basis, right from wrong. We need to have the Holy Spirit put him before us, the, the, the standard of living, that we stick to the standard of living. Love to God, love to man. Wow. That's the standard of living. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, today we are noticing that the standard of living is what I think, yep. is what I feel, is what you think, is what you feel. In other words, there are different standards. There isn't a one standard. There are multiple standards. And that's why we are going the way we are going. That's why we are going. Okay, so that Monday was basically to let us know that the spirit of the Antichrist, the one that opposes Christ, was already working in the world. And he was so right. It was not in Peter's day, not in, in Paul's day alone, it was working from Garden of Eden time, from that time. Okay, let's go to Tuesday's um, review. Satan's final strategy. What do you think that's gonna be? What do you think is his last attack? No, like every good military person, or like every sports person, like we heard, when you get your team together, you have a plan. The ultimate plan is to defeat the other team. <laughs> it's not for us to be defeated. We are going to defeat the other team. That's the ultimate plan. And how are we going to do it? By A, B, C, D. Whether it's on a chart, whether it's on the ground, whether it's in a book, that's the strategy. But the objective is to win the other team. Knock out the other team, yes. His strategy is to bring all other uh, Protestants, mm -hmm. yeah. all other Protestants to one mind, or to think the same, okay. to do the same. Good. So his strategy is to have every Christian believer to have one mind to worship him mm -hmm. by whichever means necessary. 
That sounds like Machiavelli. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. You know? We are not excluded. Yeah. So let us let us not think, as the scripture says, don't you think that you're standing while you will fall. Yeah. In other words, don't be overconfident. You know, um, I, what I'm going to say now, I know it may touch somebody's the wrong way, rub the elbow, step on the toes <laughs> or something. But I get kind of a leery when I hear Christians say, Satan can't do me nothing. Bring it on, Satan. You're right. I have a little problem with that. You're right. Why would I want to invite him to fight me? Yeah. Yeah. I am mortal. I have not reached a hundred years. That's the maximum I may reach. He has been around for at least 6,000 years. What makes you think that he doesn't know every single thing that I can do or attempt or pull off? Let me give a practical example. As I'm looking here, I think most of us have children. And those of you that don't have children, you have been a child at some point. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And you came up with a story. <laughs> and before you finish the story, your parent finished the sentence for you. Is it because they read your mind? No. They know you so well that they know what your next move is going to be. They know what the next word you're going to say before it came out of your mouth. And that's Satan. Because he has been along, around so long, he pretty much knows what we are thinking. He can't read our minds. But by certain behavior or certain stance that we do or pose, he already figured, oh, this, this one is going for the cake. <laughs> There's no question about it. <laughs> so let, let me put a little more chocolate on it. <laughs> so that's the thing. So his final strategy is to get us to separate ourselves from God. That's the final strategy. If we separate ourselves from God, guess what happens? Let me give you a terrible, let me give you a terrible example in a sense that is horrible. The lion is going to hunt. It's time to eat. And I'm just saying what I've seen on documentaries, because I'm not a lion, as you can tell. <laughs> And he begins to walk softly. He sees a herd. He stops. He watches the herd. He just doesn't go after it. He watches the herd. And he figures, ah, oh, there's that one over there. Kind of a lonely by himself. For whatever reason, young, weak, tired, injured, but it's by himself. Or stupid. <laughs> no, for whatever reason, that one is out there by himself. So he's going to go around. He's not going to go directly. He's going around. Then he rose. Or when he rose, everybody knows the lion is around. And everybody begins to run. And he's going to run in such a way that he's going to target that one that's out there. And he's going to go after him. And when he gets after him, it's a good meal. It's a good meal. It couldn't have been better. That's Satan's strategy. That's why the scripture says that he is like a... Doing what? And who is going to be that me for today? Not us. By God's grace, not us. <laughs> By God's grace, not us. Okay? But the word tells us to resist the devil. That's right. In James, James tells us that we must resist. There's something that we need to do, but we are not going to resist the devil in our strength. That's where we fail. That's what we need each other. They needed to be together when the enemy yeah. came. Eve was away from the I'm glad you said that example. You know why? Because we have some modern day Eves. <laughs> uh, let me give an example of how it works. It's a funny one. It's a funny one. Adam and Eve go to the supermarket. Adam and Eve have a plan to purchase food. And as they start, all of a sudden, Adam looks around and Eve's gone. <laughs> She's not where. Eve goes on to shop somewhere else in the supermarket. And guess what? Adam finished shopping, but Eve is not finished. Eve got caught by the lion in the back somehow. And Eve spent more than what they had planned to spend to save, to, save, to, to buy. 
Now, it's funny, but that's the reality. As Christians, we need to be close to each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to uphold each other. We don't need to wander away because as we wander away, line is, ah, that's a free meal over there. You know. So remember, the strategy is to separate us from the will of God. So with that said, we have come to the end of the review of our Sabbath school lesson for this morning. Time has flown. We were having fun. I was having fun. And I hope you were having fun too. So next week is another important lesson. Let us ask God to help us to apply it. That's the most important thing. If we can even apply one principle of what we study each week. Remember, by the ending of the year, we would have had 52 principles ingrained into us. Ingrained into us. But too often, we look at it, it looks good, it reads good, but it stops there. So I'm encouraging all of us to adopt one principle from what we study. So at this time, let us have our closing prayer. And thank you for coming. We appreciate your participation online, in person. And may God bless us as we continue. And remember, do not leave. We continue right here to have our worship at 1115 at Forest Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. You are welcome to stay and uh, worship with us. And we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for what you have reminded us. Thank you for reminding us that the struggle is real. Mm -hmm that our fight is not against flesh or blood but against principalities in high places and even so with your help with the assigned guardian angel with the gift of the holy spirit we are more than overcomers so father thank you for allowing us to to be on the planet thank you for your promises of the holy spirit we claim them and we ask that by god's grace we will be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you.
generations. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for an opportunity again to continue to worship in freedom. Father, we know that time is short, Father. So, Father, whatever we do, we want to lift up your name. And so we invite your presence in. We invite the Holy Spirit in, Father, as we worship your name and sing praises to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, if you'll stand with me, we will do the fourth commandment found in Exodus 8. I'm sorry, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, and it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, 
nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rest the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And here at Forest Hill we have a vision statement that's based on 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And it says that the vision of the Forest Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church is to be a healthy church where the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is revealed through us. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Elder Clark. Did y'all hear what she said in the reading of the invocation? God is a God of a thousand generations. Amen? Amen. Amen. And no matter what generation you are, I want to welcome each and every one of you. Is anybody here from the silent generation? That's the generation born between 1925 and 1945. Anybody claim to be in the silent generation? I see, I see a few, I see a few, I see a few, there you go. All right, anybody here from the baby boomers born from 1946 to 1964? Any baby boomers in the house? Baby boomers, I see some baby boomers, see some, all right. Then comes the baby busters or generation X born from 1965 to 1980, that's my generation. Anybody here with me? Generation, Generation X. Then we have the Millennials, or Generation Y, born between 1981 and 1996. Do I have any Millennials here? <laughs> then next, Generation Z, born from 1997 or 95 to 2012. Anybody here in Generation Z? Generation Z, all right, I see some, I see you. Now, what generation comes after Z? Who knows? Alpha, that's right, Generation Alpha, born between 2013 and 2025. Generation Alpha, where you at? Generation Alpha. I see some in here. Some of them be down for children's story a little later. No matter what generation, we want to welcome each and every one of you. We all also want to welcome, welcome our visitors visiting with us. We have Jalen Walton from Memphis, Tennessee. We also have Emerald Hammonds visiting us here from Fort Worth via Little Rock, Arkansas. Wave your hand. Wave your hand. So good to see them. My fellow Arkansans, all right. Also, we want to welcome Elena today. Elena with her daughter, Justin Faith, who is actually three today. This is her birthday. And Claudia Elena, Justin Faith and Claudia Elena. And we want to welcome each one of you. We also want to welcome Sebastian Tay and Sister Mill Dyer. Wave your hand. So good to see them. They're, they're, they're here today. All right. So good to see each and, and every one of you. Uh, at this time, we're going to bring up, uh, we'll, as we bring up, Brother Irvin, I want to wish every father a happy Father's Day. If you're a father, please stand. Please stand if you're a father. All right, let's give these fathers a hand. Amen. So good to see each and every one of you. And I pray you got something from the women's ministry as you came in this morning. Amen. This time we're going to, uh, before we bring up our pastor, we're going to let Brother Floyd Irvin give us an update. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So I just saw some men stood up, recognizing that they are men, and it's a men's weekend, you're a father. So I have something for you. This afternoon, if you come back to church around 2, 2.30, um, all those fathers that are here, we can um, show you some, some things how to improve your health. And for others that want to improve their health, you're welcome to come anytime between 2 and 5 this afternoon. Uh, make sure it's, you come today because it's a Sabbath day. It's free for you. If you come tomorrow, it's going to be some fee involved. So just take advantage of the opportunity. We want you to be a healthy person, healthy fathers first, because it's Father's Day weekend, right? And then the other individuals, male or female, young or old or in between, you can come and experience something to improve your health. Please be here on time between 2 and 2.30, and you will not regret it. Thank you for your participation, and may God bless you. Pastor, it's your time. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Oh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are thankful to be here in God's presence to worship in spirit and in truth. What a day it is to praise the name of Jesus here in this place. Have you had a good week so far? Has the Lord blessed you? Has he blessed you real good? All thanks be to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Here in God's presence, we want to give thanks and praise and worship here 
Friends, I have a special invitation now. This afternoon, we are going to be starting back again live at 5. What did I say? We are going live at 5. Once again, friends, that gives us an opportunity again to study the Word of God. And we have a special gift. We are going to be starting back our Bible study. If you're interested in studying the Word of God, we have a gift here. It is a Bible study course that we would like to begin again after church. If you're interested in joining here, friends, please be sure to see me down front. We got a big old box full of these. It is written Bible studies. And we're going to start back again with our Bible study. And those of you, many of you who have recently been baptized, friends, that give us an opportunity if you've got questions, concerns, things that you're still working your way through, that'll give us an opportunity to help answer your questions. And also, it'll help give us, even more importantly, an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better and, and connect. So we thank God for you. Studying the Word of God after church. We got a big old box of Bible studies if you want to join our Bible study. And we'll talk about when and time and place and that. So live at 5. And also we look forward to seeing you as we study the Word of God together. May God bless you as we worship Him together in spirit and in truth. At this time we're going to have our hymn of worship. Oh, how I love Jesus. stand all over the sanctuary and sing that together. There is a name, there is a name I love to hear, I love to sing His word, it sounds like music in my ears, the Sing together, say, oh, how I love Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Because he first loved me Verse 2, it tells me of a Savior's love Set me free. Who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood. It tells me of his precious the blood. sinner's perfect plea. The sinner's perfect plea. Now everybody say, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. Tells of one whose loving heart tells of one whose loving can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below.
serve an awesome God this morning. He is great and greatly to be praised as we come into God's presence here today. We thank you for 
all of his many blessings. And friends, I believe in the power of prayer. And because I believe in the power of prayer, I want to encourage you. The Bible says we ought to pray without ceasing. Friends, what does that mean? Prayer is not an event. It should be a lifestyle. It means I wake up in the morning with a prayer on my lips. I'm on my way to work. I've got a prayer in my heart. I'm coming back from school. I've got a prayer. Before I, before I open up my mouth to eat food, I've got a prayer in my heart. Friends, prayer is not an event. It ought to be a lifestyle. We ought to pray without ceasing. Pray for your families. Pray for your church. Pray for your sons and your daughters. I believe in the power of prayer. You have struggles and adversity in your life. Prayer changes things. You've got difficulty. You're sick and can't get well. Prayer changes things. You're looking for a job. Prayer changes things. I don't know how God's going to work it out, but I know that God can make a way out of no way. That if you call the name of Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There's protection in the name of Jesus. There's direction in the name of Jesus. If you call the name of Jesus, he has a way of showing up and showing out. But friends, you have not if you ask not. So you got to open up your mouth. First, if you call in prayer, you've got to first believe that he is and that he can do. And through the power of your faith, the only thing holding God back from your breakthrough is your power to believe. God can. The question is, do you have faith in order to achieve what God has in store for you? If you're watching online, friends, you be be sure to, you can text your prayer request in to the church's prayer line number, 817-293-2553. And as we're praying with you corporately, we want to invite you to pray for your family, for the people in your life. Call their, their name before God in prayer and watch what God will do for your family, for your relationship, for your life when you call the name of Jesus in prayer. This time we want to invite you, those of you who are here, to just kneel reverently with us as we come before God in this our season of prayer. And we call in the name of Jesus, Father. You said that my people which are called by my name would humble themselves in prayer. Then I would hear their cry and heal their land. Prayer changes things. Because when I was lost, you found me. Prayer changes things. Somebody here this morning would be sitting in a prison cell, but prayer. Somebody would be in an unemployment line, but prayer. Somebody would be strung out on drugs in a gutter somewhere, but prayer changes things. The Bible said the Lord will give his angels charge concerning those that love them, him. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, Lord, we call on you. We call on you, Lord, to be with our families, Lord. Our young people who have been tried and tested. So many distractions, things out there to lead them astray, Lord. I ask and pray that they would remember God who can bring them out, Lord. And remind them of a God who loves them and cares for them. More than anything else in this world, Lord, we're praying for them. I'm praying for all the marriages here, Lord. It's not an easy thing to take two people of different personalities and different walks of life and bring them together. May the two become one. So, Lord, I ask and pray that you would help us to set aside all pride and bitterness and, 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 and headstrongness. That we would put the needs of the family above even what we want for ourselves. I pray for families, Lord. I pray for our children. I pray for the ministries and missions of the church, Lord. I'm praying, O oh Lord, for community service, Sabbath school. I'm praying, O oh Lord, for personal ministries and AYS and all the different leaders of the different departments. Lord, we need your leading and your guidance as we pray for each other. I ask and pray, Lord, now that you would be with our communities in a special way, Lord. I've never seen so many 
hungry out there on the streets. I've never seen so many homeless. Lord, I ask and pray that you'd be with those out there walking on the street corners, that you would remind them about a God who is a shelter in the time of storm, a very present help in the time of trouble. Lord, be with our homeless population here in Fort Worth. I ask and pray that you'd be with the many, the many prayer requests that have been submitted here this morning, Lord. I'm praying, O oh Lord, for Pat Clark is praying for Kenneth Brown in the hospital, Lord. I'm praying for the bereaved family, Lord. We're praying for the right family, Lord. And, and those who have suffered loss, Lord, I'm praying for them. Father God, we ask and pray for Sister Turner, Lord, who's praying for her mother-in-law who had a car accident this morning. Lord, the devil is angry, but God is still good. Lord, be with that situation, Lord. I ask and pray that you be with Mary Olds and the her family, Kenny Marie, recovering from surgery, her family of strength and finding faith. Lord, we're praying, O oh Lord, for faith and unity in the church. Erica, who is healed from cancer, Lord, we praise God for God showing up. I'm praying, O oh Lord, for Rosalind Frazier, self, family, health, and healing. Pat Boyd, church family, Lord, children out of school, families in bereavement, sick and shut in, and new members, Lord, we're praying for them. Lord, I'm praying for Sister Hazel for sickness and church family, health and family. Lord, we take all these prayer requests and submit them for your throne in glory. I'm thankful this morning that we serve a God who does not just hear prayers, but a God who answers prayers. And not only does he answer prayer, but he answers the prayer we should have been praying. So God, with the Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take my prayer and join them with the prayers of the saints that we would remove in a stronghold and that there would be nothing between our soul and our Savior until the day, Lord, when we look to the hills from whence cometh our help and say, this is our God. We have waited for you. Keep us, we pray, until that day when he who shall come will come and will not tarry. In Jesus' name, let all the church of God say, amen, amen, and amen. All right, praise the Lord. We have our very special time. Jesus loves little children. All right, come on down. 12 and under, come on down for our children's story. Morning, boys and girls. Y'all glad school out? Yes, somebody say yes. Amen, amen. No homework. Don't have to pack your lunch in the morning. Amen, amen. So good to see each and every one of you. As you guys know, what state do y'all live in? Say it again. Texas. You know, down here in Texas, especially this week, we, our weather's been up and down. It's been storming. How many of y'all like thunderstorms and lightning? It's kind of scary, is it not? Sometimes when it lightens and it thunderstorms, something happens in your house sometimes. Who can tell me what, what happens usually during a thunderstorm? I mean, a really strong one. What happens? The lights. the lights go out. And when the lights go out, especially at night, you can't see nothing, can you? And it's good to have something in the house. What do you think that something is? Candles is good. What else? A flashlight. What is this? This is a flashlight. What's some good places where you can use a flashlight? In the woods, because you may be camping, huh? Where, where else are good places you can lose? It? In dark rooms. Amen, amen. How many of y'all ever lost a shoe and you got to find the other one under the bed? You have to shine it under there. Or, or you're trying to hook up some stuff in the back of a computer you can't see. It helps to have one of these, does it not? Amen, amen. Especially when the sun goes down or you can't see or... Because, you know, light can reach in places where you can't reach sometimes. And uh, like I said, under a table or a shelf. Now, uh, it's really, really useful. Even if you got a little bit of light, it helps. I remember when I was a kid, I used to have that little, that little cheap $5 digital watch that had a little light on it. 
You could be in a dark room and hit that thing. No matter how dim that light is, it'll light up that little bit of room. So just a little bit of light goes a long way, amen? Did you know God wants us to be lights? Jemiah, did you know God wants you to be a light? Did you know he wants you to be a light? <laughs> I know we don't actually glow like light bulbs. See, my finger like it's glowing, does it not? We don't actually glow like light bulbs, but he's talking about a different kind of light. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 15, 16. He said, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. So it don't do no good sticking it under a bushel or under a table or hiding it somewhere. Put it out so people can see it, so it can be used. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So you see, God wants us to use our words and actions to shine the light of Christ. If people see that you're a good and faithful person, they will wonder what makes you that way? What makes, what makes KK the way she is? Amen. What makes Braxley the way he is? <laughs> what is it about them? Well, you could tell them that Jesus makes me that way. You could tell them who? Who can you tell them? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus makes me that way. And when you shine light in the darkness, what happens to the darkness? What happens? It turns to light. It disappears. The darkness disappears. Some people live in darkness. They don't know how to have a joy or goodness because they've been in the dark so long without Jesus Christ. But if you come near them and live the life before them, you can act like this flashlight and shine light into to their darkness, into their dark lives. So don't be afraid because God always provides the light. Everybody say light. Are you going to be a light, Liana? All right, all right. You going to be a light? <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Who wants to give us a closing word of prayer? Who wants to give us a closing word of prayer? Okay, come on down, August. Let's all stand. All right, let's pray to God. Help us to be lights. I pray for everyone in this church to eat local and then stay safe, be safe on the road at dark time. And be beautiful and have a happy day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, August. Thank you, boys and girls. You may go back to your seat. Just before the, the deacons come for the tithe and offering this morning, I'd like uh, Mr. Sebastian T. to stand for a minute so you can look in the back. Mr. Sebastian T., he is the gentleman that is actually helping us with the training. It's fantastic. If you stay back, uh, come back 2 or 2.30, he will have some fantastic information, especially for fathers, especially for fathers. Others are welcome. However, we can't have everyone coming right away, but, you know, just come by between 2, two and 2.30. And tomorrow, if you come in for any um, treatment, there is a fee involved. So you need to ask me uh, about it. I don't want to promote it from the pulpit, but there's a fee involved. There will be two people for free. We have made provision for that. And today, um, I'm going out on a limb saying that individuals that come, uh, we will not be charging them anything because it's a Sabbath. But tomorrow, the first two individuals that come, it will be covered. So I just want you to see Mr. T, if you just raise your hand again, that's Mr. T, Sebastian T. Just so you know, he has more than 30 years of experience. Thank you so much. You can be seated. At this time, we'll have the deacons come forward to pick up the morning tithes and offering. And we're praying. Our God and our Father, you have been indeed our Jehovah Jireh. You have provided for us. You have given us strength. You have given us skills. And many of us have traded in those skills and knowledge for something that is called money, checks, whichever way it's been called. And now, Father, with an expression of recognition of who you are, we 
come this morning to return our tithes and to express our love in the form of offering. And so we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have five different ways to give, or perhaps six, with the modern technology. The old traditional way is that someone come by your house and pick it up because you are unable to come by for whatever reason, and they are more than happy to come and assist you that way. The other way is that you were not able to come in church on time on Sabbath because you had some other appointment, engagement. So you decided to use our drop box in the back. And then, of course, if you are still with the U.S. postal system, you can mail it in. But then, in the last few years, we have been doing the traditional in person. As you come to worship, as we come to worship, we bring our tithes and offering. But now we have two other sophisticated ways. Online. If you will online, if you will download our church app, you can return your tithes and offering. Or the church has a cash app. It's called Forest Hill. Lot of Forest Hill. I can't read the rest. I'm so sorry. Cash app. ForestHillSDA.org. That's the other way to return. So I just want to encourage us to return our tithes and offering because God has promised us blessings. He has challenged us to challenge him. And in the challenge, he says to us, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And here's the challenge that God gives us. He says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Do we believe God? Have we entrusted our riches to God? Have we entrusted our skills? I would say yes we have and we can be certain that God will bless us and we're praying. Father in heaven, in your faithfulness you have challenged us to prove you. Many of us have done it for years. Others are in the beginning stage of trusting you. Whichever be the case, Father, we are asking that in your providence, in your grace, in your love, that you will respond to us the challenge that you have given. That we will not have enough room to receive the blessing that you give us, not only for ourselves, but to bless others. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain seated as the deacons are returning with the tithes and offering. And let us prepare our minds and our bodies and our souls as the praise team come and help us to praise God through music. May us continue to receive God's blessing in Jesus' name. Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, stand and proclaim, there is no greater name than Jesus, Jesus, see there is there is a name that's a place that's a place i can run i can run and be saved there is a name that can heal that can heal all my storm all my storm peace be still peace be still i can call all
There is no greater name than Jesus. Healing in the name of Jesus. So we stand and proclaim there is no greater name than many of you who here this morning knows that that name still works oh there is a name I love to hear I love to sing its worth Sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. That name provides liberty to those in bondage. That name is light for those in darkness. That name, freedom from those in despair. Oh, there's something about the name Jesus. can light up the darkness in my life. There's something about that name, Jesus. Oh, there's power in the name of Jesus this morning. How many of you know that? Power in the name of Jesus. You have your Bible. I want to invite you to turn with me, if you would, for just a few moments to Daniel, the fourth chapter. Daniel chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in your hearing Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 28. Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 28, as I read this in your hearing, it said, And all this came among King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace in Babylon. And the king spoke, saying, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling, my mighty power, and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, A voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of our word. Our message is entitled Part 2 of our series, Baggage Check. Let us pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we invite you, we welcome you here into this place. May there be nothing between our soul and our Savior. Nothing keeping us from riches on high. Hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the church of God say amen. Baggage check. Baggage check. My friends, we are coming here together once again. Our message is entitled Baggage Check. For those of you who recall my last time together, right before our camp meeting, first off, how many of you had a chance to join us for camp meeting? It just was that a blessing? I, I am so thankful. And those of you who joined us in church last week, we heard a mighty word from Elder Tim. We are certainly thankful for that as well. God has blessed us real good, and I know the Lord has certainly shown himself strong. We are continuing in our series, 
baggage check, baggage check part two. We're exploring things that uh, are weighing us down from being all that God has called us to be. On our first part one, just for a quick review, uh, the first thing that we had discussed that is baggage, spiritual baggage. Uh, we talked about the baggage of bitterness. You see, bitterness is that thing that happens in your relationships uh, that when you have hurt that has been unaddressed, pain that has been unaddressed, things that have for years been swept under the rug and never talked about and discussed and uh, aired that dirty laundry, uh, that that unaddressed hurt festers and comes out in ways that you wish that it didn't sometimes. That unaddressed hurt becomes bitterness and it ruins relationships. It ruins trust. It breaks bonds and it breaks and weighs us down. It keeps us from being all that we can be. These are things that are spiritual baggage. You see, I believe, friends, that God wants us as Christians to take flight. We're talking about baggage here. Many of us are preparing for summer vacations and taking trips to exotic locations. But one thing I know is before you get on the plane, you've got to put everything that you're carrying with you, you've got to put it on a scale. Are you hearing me this morning? The reason why you've got to put your bag on a scale is because before you go up, the plane has to determine whether or not you've got too much that's holding you down. Are you hearing me this morning? I believe that there are some people in this world who God wants to help them go up, but before they go up, they've got to check their bags to make sure there's not too much stuff holding them down. Before God makes you go up, you've got to let go of whatever it is that's holding you down. Whether that thing be bitterness, whether that thing be pride, whether that thing be ego, whatever it is that would hold you down, God wants you to ride on the high places. God wants you to be the head and not the tail. God wants you to experience the joy of salvation, but God cannot help you go up if you've got too much stuff holding you down. My friends, I want nothing between my soul and my Savior. The first thing we discussed is bitterness, spiritual baggage of bitterness, hurt feelings, someone that said something unkind and someone who had hurt you. And we hold on to that thing, and it can cause you to lose your salvation. Friends, forgiveness and putting aside helps us to wipe the slate clean and move forward in the grace of God. We want to let go of that spiritual baggage. The second thing we want to discuss that bring spiritual baggage. We want to talk about something that you don't hear discussed in church too much. We are going to talk about the spirit, the spiritual baggage called pride. We're going to talk about that spiritual baggage called pride. You don't hear too many preachers talk about pride here, friends. In fact, in church circles, in society as a whole, that seems to be a sin that is least discussed, but I would submit to you that sin is probably the most dangerous of all the sins, the sin of pride. Why is pride so dangerous, friends? Because it stops us from having an honest assessment of what is wrong in our lives. It stops us from taking a good hard look in the mirror and saying, I've got to do better. I've got some things I've got to work on. I've got some things that I've got to adjust. Pride is a thing that helps us to walk around with our chests puffed out, thinking we are high and mighty and holier than thou. And unfortunately in society, it's seen as a sign of weakness to say, I'm sorry. 
Unfortunately, in society, it's seen as a sign of weakness to acknowledge your flaws and your mistakes and say, I've got a long way to be like the Lord. See, the reason why pride don't get talked about a whole lot in church, I got a secret. I'm going to roll th this thing back here, friends. Folks don't talk about pride too much in church. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm roll back the curtain now, friends. The reason why they don't be talking about pride in church is because there's a whole lot of preachers who suffer from the sin of pride. And so they don't talk about it because they love the spotlight. But friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that pride comes before fall. We've got to check ourselves, constantly look in the mirror, and not start getting too full of ourselves. Because I believe that God has a way, and when you get too high and mighty, God has a way of reminding you who you really are. God has a way. Our story begins in the fourth division of Daniel. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, the fourth chapter. Nebuchadnezzar was an interesting character in Bible history. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was the instrument that God used to take the children of Israel into captivity. You see, God's people had gotten a little bit too high and mighty and full of themselves. They'd gotten a little bit too arrogant. They'd gotten a little bit too going around and saying, I'm the chosen people, the ones that God has put in their hands on. And so God had to remind Israel that you're not great because of your intellect. You're not great because of your degrees. You're not great because of your titles. You're not great because you've got letters besides your name or because you drive a fancy car or live in a nice house or got some dollars in your bank account. That's not the thing that makes you great. You see, you're great because before you were a people, you were my people. You were great because when, I, when you called on my name, I was there to answer you that when you were a slave in Egypt, I was the one who broke the chains that held you bound. I was the one who led you with a pillar of fire and a cloud. Don't get so full of yourself that you think you did this thing. And so God has to, had to remind them, and he used the instrument. He used a heathen king now, friends. You see, sometimes God uses ungodly people to accomplish his godly purpose. You ain't hear me this morning. I said sometimes God uses ungodly people to accomplish his godly purpose. God needed someone to take Israel down a pig. So he sent the armies of Babylon surrounding the holy city. And they took Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Took them away to Babylon. I said Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting character because, friends, the lesson that God had anointed him to teach the children of Israel, he ended up having to learn it himself. In Daniel chapter 2, students of Bible prophecy know that Nebuchadnezzar has a vision. He sees a statue with a head of gold and arms of silver and, and a waist of bronze and feet of iron. He sees this statue representing the world powers that would come on the scene. And Daniel says, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Well, now Nebuchadnezzar takes this. This vision that God gave him, reminding him that God sets up kingdoms and God causes them to sit down. And Nebuchadnezzar says, well, I like the head of gold, but I'm going to make me a whole statue now. And so the Bible says, students of prophecy know that he sets up a statue in the plain of Dura. And it says, when you hear the sound of the music, 
I want everybody in the plane to bow down because I'm not just the head of gold, I'm the whole statue. And everybody begins to bow down. And the trumpets began to play and the music and the horns began to play, friends. It kind of reminds me of how right now, uh, well, let me, that's, that's going to make somebody uncomfortable, but they, they, they said when the music plays called the national anthem, they say everybody got to put their hand on their heart. Well, friends, before I'm an American, I'm a Christian. And I'm going to bow before the throne in glory, before I bow to a government. I love my country, but I love my God more. Amen, saints? Everybody bowed when the music, when the Babylonian national anthem began to play. Everyone bowed except for three folk. Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro. So Nebuchadnezzar, I told you he's an interesting character. He got upset, threw them into the fiery furnace, and all of a sudden they see folk walking around. I thought I put three people in there. But I see somebody else who looks like the Son of God in the furnace. It don't matter how hot the oven gets, God is in the furnace. Should have learned his lesson. But Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way. Some of us got to learn. Some, listen, friends, I ain't got to bump my head to know I shouldn't bump my head. Some of us got to learn the hard way. The best teacher is not experience. The best teacher is learning from somebody else's experience. Are you hearing me this morning? I ain't got to bump my head to know I shouldn't bump my head. But when I saw you fall and bump your head, that tells me to be careful. I ain't got to touch a hot stove to know I shouldn't touch a hot stove. But when I saw you burn yourself, I learned from your experience. He saw how God had humbled Israel. But he didn't learn the lesson that God was trying to teach him. And so now we get here to the fourth chapter of Daniel now. He had, he's, he, God keeps trying to get him to wake up and he's not getting it. Over and over again, God keeps trying to get him to wake up and he's not giving it. And finally, earlier on in the fourth chapter of Daniel, the Bible tells us that he receives a vision that lets him know uh, that God is able to cause kingdoms to rise and he causes kingdoms to fall. And still, he did not get the message. He had to learn it the hard way. Verse 25 says that, you, that, that I need to remind you that God, the most high rules all kingdoms. You just a placeholder, buddy. I need to remind you that you wouldn't be where you are if God did not say the word. I need to remind you that it is God who causes nations to rise and fall. And God chooses whoever he will choose to rule. This ain't about you, buddy. If it was not you, Nebuchadnezzar, I would have used somebody else. We got to get, get out this idea that God needs us for something. Listen, God don't need you. We need him. That's how this thing works. Listen, God could raise up another Pastor Watkins. He could go out of the field and cause a rock to cry out. Are you hearing me, friends? He could cause a pew to start singing hallelujah. God does not, he can make something out of nothing. God don't need you. He chooses to use you. God don't owe you nothing. It's a privilege to stand up and serve the Lord. That's what it is. God saw mercy and favor. I'm not up here because I deserve it. I'm up here because God saw fit. So the Bible tells us now, we're going on, we're in the fourth chapter of Daniel now. The Bible says, 
that Nebuchadnezzar begins to feel himself and forget himself. The Bible said now it's been about 12 months since he saw the vision that God causes nations to rise and fall. In verse 27, they said, if you want your kingdom to last, this is what you got to do. Verse 27, the same chapter. Therefore, O king, this is my advice. Daniel is giving advice to Nebuchadnezzar. You want your kingdom to last. This is what you got to do. This is my advice. I want you to break off your sins and start being righteous. I want you to start showing mercy to the poor. If you want your nation to last, do those two things and you will prosper. Nebuchadnezzar hears that disregards the message and starts feeling himself. So now we get down to the text in question now, verse number 28. The Bible says that, they, that, 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 that the king Nebuchadnezzar now, it's been about 12 months since Daniel and God tried to remind him of where he came from. So he starts walking in the royal palace. The Bible says that, that, that Babylon was one of the great ancient wonders of the world, the greatest city that ever lived. You see, Babylon, if you've seen in your map, it was in a place in the world referred to as a cradle of civilization. The first major cities arose in Babylon, the Fertile Crescent, the beginnings of society, the first cities founded by Nimrod, the builder in Genesis Babylon, the great metropolis before London and Tokyo and Paris. It was Babylon the great. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was there. And so the king begins to walk out and look amongst all that he has conquered. All that he has accomplished. All the things that he has done. He goes out and begins to survey his territory. He begins to survey all of his conquests. He begins to survey all of his great things that he has done. And the Bible tells me he starts to feel himself. And in verse 30, the Bible said he starts to say to himself, Is not this the great Babylon? that I have built for a royal dwelling. There's a whole lot of first person pronouns in that sentence. I did this. I built this. I am the reason for this. I was the one by my mighty power to establish the greatest nation the world has ever known. Verse 31 now, while the word was still in his mouth. Now, friends, can't nobody humble you like God humble you. They said uh, he, he was still forming the vowels in his mouth. He was still articulating his sentence. He was still following the words, talking about his greatness. And while the word was in his mouth, he received a word from heaven. You think you did this? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen now with all your greatness. You see, friends, it don't take much for God to set somebody down. Get past the walk and start feeling himself. It ain't that hard for God to set me down and put somebody else up here. If God got to do what he got to do, he will do it. And ain't nobody going to humble you like God does. The, the, the word was still in his mouth. God did not wait. They will drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. They're going to make you eat grass. Can you imagine now? This would be like the President of the United States giving the State of the Union address. And then the next day you see him out on all fours, Biden, walking on all fours, eating grass. 
It'll be on every newspaper, the front page. He's lost it. It'll be on CNN, breaking news. I'm Wolf Blitzer. President done lost his mind. But the Bible said the king of the most powerful nation on earth, that very hour, verse 33, began to walk in the grass. Just like the oxen. Bible said his hair began to grow like an eagle's feathers. Oh, it got so bad as he began to foam at the mouth. Dignitaries and foreign, and foreign leaders were walking by and closed their eyes in embarrassment to what they had seen. The Bible said his nails began to grow long like the claws of an eagle. And as he is there and people, the most powerful man on earth, they began to point and laugh and mock and scorn him. In that moment, he realizes that I might be king, but there is a king of kings. I might be up here, but God causes nations to rise and fall. You see, friends, the thing that we've got to understand and realize is that pride is the most dangerous of all sins. And when you start to feel yourself, you begin to read your own press clippings. You begin to see on social media, you know, that stuff can feed into your pride. Folk, I, I just looked on Facebook, I got 27 likes. No, oh, you read... A thousand people retweeted me. And then you start feeling yourself. Maybe I really do got it going on. I put that picture of myself, boy, and they're like, oh, you so, you so fine. Start feeling yourself, boy. Walking around with, like you ain't know where you came from. Well, listen, one, listen, God knew you when you were still ashy. God knew you before you got them, them hair extensions. When the only thing you had was nappy and happy, God knew you and he loved you then. Are you hearing me this morning? Oh, don't forget where you came from. Friends, if it had not been for the Lord, where would you be? The Bible declares that in Proverbs it said that pride comes before a fall. This story we hear over and over again about people who gain notoriety, who gain, who gain recognition, begin to feel themselves a little bit too much. And then, they, and then they end up getting out there and making a fool out of themselves. Hello, Kanye West. Got a little bit too full of yourself. Oh, I've got shoes. I'm on TV. I'm in the music video. Now I'm going to talk about my friend Hitler. Feeling yourself. And forgot who you really was. God has to lay some folk down. God has to remind you. You see, friends, no matter how high you get, you need to have somebody to tell you, Yo, you know what? Stink like everybody else. All them people you see on TV, they got to wake up and blow their nose. They got to wash their behind. They put their pants on one leg at a time just like you. You don't know what that, that model looked like before, he, before Photoshop and makeup and hair and, all, and nails got done. You, you, you think they look perfect. You don't know what happened before they went in the booth. My friends, there's so much fakeness going around. People need to be real with themselves and with God. Folk need to be real. Too much artificial. But the reason why folk are not real is because pride 
we, everybody wants to be well thought of and put out there that they're living the perfect life. As if the kids ain't getting your last nerves. As if you ain't having an argument with your wife. As if you ain't have times in your life where you want to throw in the towel. My friends, I believe that we as a church would be more effective reaching out in the community if they saw that we got struggles just like everybody else. I believe that some folk are staying outside of church because they think they're not good enough to walk through them doors. If only they knew. We have people just like everybody else. People with problems. Jesus said, I have not come with the righteous, but to seek and to save that which was lost. But they don't talk about pride in church because there's a whole lot of folk in church who got pride, including a whole lot of pastors. Jesus talked about spiritual pride in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. I want to go there with me here, friends, because Jesus expose a spiritual pride we see a lot of pride in our politics right we see a lot of pride in our community and friends i believe that there's a whole lot of pride going on in church the reason why friends the reason why friends is that historically now historically now the only place that we could really be ourselves is when we came to church so what happens now friends society tells you you ain't worth nothing Society beats you up and beats you up. And the only place you can be the man is when you walk through those doors. Some folk got to strut when they walk through because this is the only place they can be themselves. But be careful now, friends. Be careful. We're turning now. We're talking about pride. We're talking about spiritual baggage. I'm not saying this to try to tear nobody down. I'm saying this because I want us to take flight. Are you hearing me, friends? And the only way we can take flight is to let go of some of that baggage. Pride is spiritual baggage. You see, God can't work with you if you already think you got all the answers. God can't teach folk who know everything. God can't fill you if you ain't empty. God can't fix you if you're not broken. God can't heal you if you don't acknowledge you're hurting. And God can't save you if you don't acknowledge you need salvation. So come just as you are, flaws and all, and God will lift you up. You see, here's the, th here's the way this thing works here, friends. God's specialty is afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. That's how God works now. If you think you're up here, God's going to yank you down. And if you're down here, God's going to pick you up. Now, what I want God to do is I want God to pick me up. Are you hearing me, friends? Let's talk about this thing. Let's talk about this thing now, friends. We're in Matthew, Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Matthew, the 23rd chapter now, friends. We're dealing with this spiritual baggage. How do I know in my life I got pride now, friends? How do I know in my life I got pride? Friends, your pride tends to be bothered by the pride of others. That's how, that's how you can identify pride now. So if you are a preacher and you see someone else preach a good word, instead of being happy that God's saints were blessed, you get mad. You say, I could have did it better. If you are a singer and you see somebody saying that thing, instead of being happy because God's saints was blessed, you're going to get mad and say, I could have sang it better. Uh, it's pride is in somebody else's shining, you get angry. That's what made the devil mad. He saw Jesus shining, and instead of being happy, he got angry. You think you together? I, I, I got some shine too. That's how you can tell pride's going on. Now, we're in Matthew, Matthew chapter 23 now, friends. Matthew chapter 23, we're talking about religious pride now, friends. Matthew chapter 23, we're going to look here now, friends, and verse, in verse number, the, we're, we're looking at Matthew 23 now, and verse number 5. The Bible said, but all their works they do to be seen by men. It's talking about the religious folk in his day, Jesus was. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. 
What is Jesus talking about here, friends? He's talking about religious pride, spiritual pride. What is Jesus talking about? What is a phylactery? Well, now that's something that you would put a little Bible verse in a little box and you'd put it on your forehead to say that you've been reading. So you put a scripture on your forehead, and the bigger your scripture you put on your forehead, you had a big old box on your head walking around just to show everybody how much you've been reading your Bible. That's what pride does. You think, you, you think you're showing off that you're some, and really what you're doing is you're making a fool out of yourself. Jesus said, Everybody, you get them big old boxes of scriptures and you put them on your forehead and, and everybody's competing. I got a bigger box than you got. Oh, you think your box is big. I got a bigger box than you got. I've been, I've been really reading my Bible more than you. What do they do? They love the best places and feasts. Verse 6. They love the best seats in synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But do not be called Rabbi, for there is one your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Did you catch that, friends? Friends, it makes me uncomfortable when I hear people out here. You may hear people around saying, Reverend this and Reverend that. I don't know, that's one thing I don't mess with because the Bible said God is Reverend. Hey, we ain't got but one master. I ain't nobody's master. I'm a manservant just like everybody else here. Are you hearing me, friends? There is one rabbi, one teacher, Christ. And we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 9. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. We talk about Father's Day this weekend, ain't we? Now, now let's talk about spiritual pride once again now, friends. There are some friends in other religions who like to talk about the priest and they would say, Father so-and-so, Father so-and-so, Father so-and-so, we are so happy to have you, Father so-and-so. Well, now, friends, if you weren't the one in the grocery store paying for food on my table when I was growing up, I ain't calling you daddy. If you weren't the one who dropped that check for tuition so I could go to school, I ain't calling you daddy. You ain't the one who drove me back and forward. I need to go somewhere who kept a roof over my head, food on my table, clothes on my back. Only Calvin Watkins Sr. is daddy here on earth. And only my father in heaven is father. But folk get caught up in titles and names. And being seen. Oh, I'm the elder. No, I'm the deacon. No, I sit on this board. No, I'm a part of this group. No, I got this degree. Friends, does your pride matter more than your salvation? People care about their reputation more than their salvation. And the same thing that caused the Jews to need to be humbled. I believe there's some spiritual pride going on amongst a lot of us Seventh-day Adventists too. I love everybody, but I got to tell the truth. What do they do? They walked around saying we were the chosen people. Don't we walk around saying we the chosen church? Friends, Better off does not mean better than. If not for the grace of God, so go I. It's important for this thing to be about service rather than about status. Are you hearing me, friends? This is about service, not status. 
A whole lot of people come in church because they want to be up here and say, everybody else, you down here. When really what you ought to be about is if someone is hungry, I feed you. When someone is naked, I clothe you. When someone's in prison, I visit you. It ought to be about love rather than your reputation. And a lot of people are on the outside looking in because they see people who are more concerned with thinking they special rather than trying to do what God said in the world. Now I'm going to say something else. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I got to say it anyway. Some folk like to walk around claiming they built some stuff. I love everybody. We respect everybody's contributions, all of that stuff. But here's one thing I know. If you just came to church five minutes ago, or you've been in the church for 40 years, you're not worth more to God because you've been here a long time compared to somebody who just gave their life to the Lord. Are you hearing me? God is not any respecter of persons. And so when folk want to talk about I'm the pillar of this or I found him this or I built this, well, now the Bible tells me that except the Lord build this house, they labor in vain that build it. I know, it's getting quiet up in there. Well, we got to tell it like it is now. If we built this church, it will fail. If God did it, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass. So which one do we want to do? We want to take the credit or we want to give God the glory? I believe that God did this thing. I respect everyone's contributions, but ain't nobody built this church but Jesus. This rock is Jesus. He is the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. This church has one foundation. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you're building this church on Pastor Watkins, you're in trouble. you building this church on an elder, you're in trouble. Well, folk who did stuff back in the day, we respect everyone's contributions, but here's how this thing works. One plants, another waters, and then God gives the increase. This thing is bigger than Pastor Watkins or the elders or deacons or anybody else. We don't own God's people. This church belongs. I, I, ain't die, I love you, but I ain't die for your sins. God is in control. So now, friends, we've got to root out pride wherever it may be. Spiritual pride. Religious pride. There's a whole lot of marriages on the rocks, I believe, this morning because folks didn't know how to say them two words. When I messed up, say I'm sorry. I could do better. But instead we walk around and want to paper stuff over, cover stuff up because it hurts our ego too much to acknowledge when something is wrong. And we can do better. Pride stops us from coming to Jesus just as we are. Pride stops us from owning up to our sins and making, helping God to make us better. Pride blinds us to what is wrong so that Jesus can make it right. I've got to acknowledge the bad news about me before I find the good news in Jesus. What's the bad news about me? I'm a sinner. But the good news is Jesus specializes in saving sinners. Bad news about me. It don't matter how hard I work. I can never get, be good enough to get up there. But the good news is we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. We're going to be saved, but you can't do it unless you give him the glory. You want credits? You're not getting up there. I can't get myself two inches off the ground by my righteousness. Only to the blood of the Lamb. 
I can be saved. But I've got to acknowledge my need for him. Acknowledge my trust in him. Acknowledge my belief in him. And that I can't do anything unless God helps me to do it by his blood. So now we talked a little bit about pride. What can we do about it now, friends? We're talking about baggage now. We're about getting ready to close now, friends. I told you that before you're taking a journey somewhere now, it's important for you to check your baggage, check your bags, and make sure that you're only packing the essentials. I'm going to close with this story, friends, now. Before mountain climbers, before they go up the side of a mountain, they open up all their bags. They do extensive research and make sure that the only thing they're packing is strictly the essentials. Because if you're, cli- if you're trying to go up, every pound of unnecessary weight is going to make the journey more difficult. If you're trying to go up, everything that's weighing you down is going to make it even that much more harder to go up. Let me tell you how Jesus put this thing. He said, if your right arm offends you, take it off. If your right eye offends you, take it off. Jesus was not talking about amputating nobody. He was saying, anything that's getting in your way from going up yonder, get rid of it. Some of us here this morning, we got some relationships weighing us down. You might have to let go of that relationship. Some of us, we got some habits that's weighing us down. You may have to let go of that habit. Some of us got some, some things in our life that are weighing us down. Maybe it's bitterness towards a relationship. Maybe it's pride that's holding us back. So now if you're going to, if you're a mountain climber now, if you're a hiker, you've, they do extensive research. They make sure they got the right type of bag that's light enough. And they make sure they're packing only the essentials. Only the things they need to keep them alive is what I'm putting in the bag. Are you hearing me, friends? That means I'm going to leave some of that stuff that might be nice to have, but I don't need to have. It's got to stay out the bag. There's a whole lot of stuff that, 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 that might be permitted, but are not going to help us move up. You see, not, see, there's a whole lot of stuff that God allows you to have, but ain't necessarily going to help you get to glory. You got to look in your bag and say, what's some of this stuff, this baggage I got to leave out? You got some extra clothes. Maybe you need to give some of that stuff to Goodwill. You got some bad relationships. You got to let some of that stuff on the side. There's too much stuff that's holding you down. The only thing I need is the essentials. I'm going up. Here's one thing I found out. You realize how much junk you got when it's time to move somewhere. You ever notice that? You ever moved somewhere? The more stuff you have means the longer you intend to stay somewhere. That's how it works. So if I'm going somewhere for a week, I'm only packing for a week. If I'm going somewhere for a day, I don't need a change of clothes for a week's worth, I'm just going to be there for a day. Some of us have got loaded down with so much baggage, it's almost like y'all, y'all intend to stay here for good. But I read somewhere, this world is not my home. So just pack the essentials. I've got somewhere I need to be. Just pack the essentials. God is trying to do something in my life. And God can't get me from where I am to where he wants me to be. I can't take flight if I've got too much stuff, if I've got too much pride holding me down, if I've got too much bitterness holding me down, if I've got too much stuff, baggage, things in my past that I have not yet let go. God is trying to say to me, I want you to spread wings like eagles and fly. But you can't do it. Unless you unload some of your bags. Who here this morning is ready to unload their bags? Bible says in John, said, come unto me all you that labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. What is a burden? That's baggage. Baggage of your past. We're going to let that thing go. What is your baggage this morning? 
baggage of bad habits, bad relationships. Whatever it is in your life that's holding you back from being all you can be in Christ. I believe that four seals got a little bit of baggage we got to let go of too. We got to make a choice. We appreciate where we've been, but we're not going to stop from where we're going. Do you care more about your legacy or your destiny, friends? We got to make a choice. We can't go forward doing the same stuff we did 20 years ago. Different world, different times. All the gospel is the same, but we got to find new ways to get it out there. I appreciate the contributions of those before, but friends, don't let your legacy hold your destiny hostage. What's your baggage? Do we want to walk around strutting our stuff? Or do we want to walk around heaven all day? Which one do we want? You want to say I'm up here and everyone else is down here? Well, if you're too high and mighty, God's going to pull you down. But if you're down, God's going to pick you up. Which one is it, friends? There's somebody here this morning. You want to let go of that baggage. Baggage of pride. Whatever it is in your life that you've got to adjust to. Someone has some criticism that makes sense. Something that i got to work on and improve on. I'm not going to take it personal. I'm going to look in my, in myself dead in the mirror and say, i got a long way to be like the Lord. I can't do that if I don't put aside my pride. My ego, this ain't about me. I've got somewhere to go. If you make that commitment right now this morning, I want you to stand with me. I'm putting aside that baggage. You got somewhere to go. I'm traveling light. I don't need all that foolishness. I'm, I've got somewhere to go. I don't need to be loaded down with all that stuff. I've got somewhere to go. Putting aside the drama. Putting aside the mess. I'm putting aside my past. I've got somewhere to go. I'm unloading my baggage. I don't want them to put me on the scales and be found wanting. I don't want to, to try to go up with burdens that have not yet been lifted. Anything I don't need for my journey, I'm leaving it behind. Leaving aside my pride, my ego. Leaving aside thinking I have all the answers. Leaving aside thinking I got it figured out. I trust in you. You are where my help comes from. There's someone here this morning. You got somewhere to go. I don't know where you come from, what you've been through, but I, I believe someone here this morning needs to take that next step in grace. You got some baggage in your life. Baggage of thinking you got it all figured out. Give it all to Jesus right now. If that's you, man, woman, boy, girl, you want to let your burdens be lifted at Calvary's cross, let it go. Quit trying to figure out your salvation. Jesus said it's finished. He already did it. That's you, man, woman, boy, girl. You want to take your stand in grace. I want you to just raise your hand wherever you are. Maybe you need to be baptized. You need to take your stand. You need someone to pray for you. Wherever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, it's time to take your stand. Wherever you are. Just raise your hand. Don't worry about what people around you are saying. Care more about your salvation than your reputation. Is that you, man, woman, boy, girl? I'm taking my stand in grace right now. God is calling someone. Just raise your hand wherever you are. 
I know everybody's watching. Just raise your hand. If you need to take that stand, God bless you. God bless you. You need to take your stand in grace. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus. We've all got some baggage. But the Holy Ghost is doing a baggage check this morning. He's checking all the preachers for pride. He's checking our members for holier than thou attitudes. Because only the humble will God lift up. Only the empty will God fill their cup. So we come to you right now without any ears. We pull down the facade of perfection. And we're coming to you right now just as we are. Without one plea, we've come to you. Because only you can make us whole. Only you can make us all we can be. Only you can transform our life. We believe in you. Trust in you. And burdens are lifted at Calvary's cross. Bless us, we pray. And may we walk forward with the news of life, knowing that God has granted us the victory in Christ Jesus. Bless us, we pray. For whosoever the Son of Man sets free shall be free indeed. In Jesus' name we pray that all the church of God say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. God bless you. Our new brothers and sisters, those of you who will be joining us for Bible study, please be sure to meet me down front after church. We have a Bible study course that we are making available to you. May God bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Thanks for worshiping with us here at Forest Hill. And as always, remember, you matter to God. You matter to us too. And always remember, a city that's set in a hill can never be hid. God bless you.